I know you're not going to believe this, but I don't plan to speak long. But I do want to make some remarks about Christian school. Brother Mike said this is a burden on my heart, and it is. For a few years, we didn't have Christian school. And it broke my heart that we didn't have a place to offer our people where they could, they could send their kids to Christian school. We, for a year or two, I can't remember how long, actually, we had a church van and we let parents use the van to haul their kids down to Emmaus to Christian school. And uh, because we just believe in it. I said, we believe in it. And I just want to say a few things about that. You know, as a church, First Baptist Church is made up of Bible believers. And what that means is we accept the Bible as God's holy word. We here at First Baptist also accept the Bible as our sole source of authority for faith and practice. Now, what's that mean? That means we preach, we teach, we declare, we live by the Bible. We practice what the Bible says. When people ask me, what's the difference between your church and Catholic church or Methodist church? I just hold up the Bible. And I say this. What we believe, what we teach, what we preach, what we practice is biblical. If it's not, we're not going to do it. Now, we don't follow papal edicts. We don't follow decisions made by a presbytery somewhere. And we don't follow the writings of any man. We follow the book written by God. And that is the reason we have a Christian school. You see, if you'll, if you'll read your Bible, you'll quickly learn that there are several places in the Bible that lead us and direct us to taking the responsibility of educating our children in a Christian manner. For many of us, this is not an option. My wife and I got saved in 1974. Our oldest son, Arthur, was in first grade. Our daughter, Angela, was in kindergarten. And the next year, we started a school at Faith Baptist Church. And we made the decision then, our children are not going to public school. Now, could we afford Christian school? No. That was a fact of it. But we were willing to make whatever sacrifice had to be made that our kids would not be in public school. Now, that was in 1974, 75. Public schools changed a whole lot since then. But even then, we saw what God's word said about our responsibility to educate our children in, in a biblical way. Now, there are several places in the Bible. I'm going to show you some of them tonight. And as I said, for many of us, this is just not an option. There are many who could not in all good conscience surrender their children and our children to the public school system. These schools have sought to remove all biblical or Christian values, references, from their campuses. They don't want anything to do with Christianity. These schools are forced now to follow the mandates of Harrisburg and Washington in our area. Whatever the state government says, whatever the federal government says, our schools have to do. Doesn't matter how we feel about it. Doesn't matter how the community feels about it. It's what the government says. Now, these schools are being forced to allow transgender bathrooms and shower uh, rooms and locker rooms and who knows what else has come down the pike. We understand that there are a lot of things about the public school we do not agree with. And let me say this. I believe the Christian school movement really excelled when they took the Bible out of the public school. At that point, a lot of Christians said, we're not sending our kids to public school anymore. And in the late 60s, early 70s, through the 70s, 
we saw across America a proliferation of Christian schools. Churches were starting Christian schools because of that. But it seems like since then, a, 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 lot, of, a lot of Christians have just lost that, that, that idea, have lost that truth that the, Christian, the public schools are nothing but pagan schools. And that's why we have a Christian school. Now, you say, well, you said you're going to show us in the Bible. Well, go over to Deuteronomy. By the way, don't tell me, oh, that's Old Testament. I know where it's located. But the principle is throughout Christian life. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Now here we see the, the, the statement of the responsibility that it is the parent's responsibility to educate their children. Now, I know we're not all educators, but understand the responsibility falls on us as parents. You see, here's the fact of the matter. If you're a parent, one day you will answer to God for how you raise your children. He gave them to you to raise for him. We're accountable. And so we must look to the word and find out what does God expect of me as a parent? And this is one area we're to be the parents that God wants us to be. We're to teach them. And if you'll get the gist of what he's saying, he's saying 24 hours a day, every day, we need to be teaching, we need to be instilling in our children Christian principles, Christian precepts, Christian values. That's what God expects. It's not the state's responsibility, really, to educate our schools or our children. Now, in America, you know, that came to be because of the community schools, and then, of course, that graduated to bigger systems, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know, I think Americans have bought into this thing that you've got to have a big school system with lots of frills in order to educate a young person. But, you know, I think back to the days of the one-room schoolhouse. And we educated some pretty good people in those one-room schoolhouses. See, we've departed from reading, writing, reading, writing, and arithmetic in our public schools. We've got all kinds of other stuff that really is unnecessary. And we're dumping millions and millions of dollars into our public schools, and they're not doing the job. But even if they were, they don't come from a Christian perspective at all. We have a responsibility. And then go over to Ephesians chapter... Six. This is for the naysayers who said, oh, that's Old Testament. Are you there? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. <laughs> we love that, don't we? <laughs> Amen. We like to beat them over the head with that. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, <laughs> you listening, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Don't want any early funerals. And ye fathers, dad, you listening? Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's our responsibility. Nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's, that's what the parent is supposed to do. Now, in order for that to be true, number one, the home has to be a godly home. Listen, I've worked with young people for a long time. I learned this very early in my dealings with young people. If the home is not Christian, and people are professing to be Christians and being hypocritical, Coming to church like they're great Christians and going home and acting like the devil, you're going to have a problem with your kids. Okay. 
I found this out. You know, most of the time when we have problems with teenagers, we can trace it back to problems in the home. Not all the time, but many times. One of the, listen, one of the greatest ways you can ruin a young person is to be a hypocrite in your home. See, they see right through that, and it tears them up. So we have to have Christian homes. What do you mean Christian homes? Where the Lord's name is lifted up, where there's devotions, where there's Bible reading, where there's prayer, and where the parents are walking with God. Christian home. I'm amazed at how many Christian parents expect their kids to have a walk with God when they don't have one. Ooh. Did I say that? I think I did. Now, the home must be a Christian home. But then the school must be a a Christian school and support the teaching of the home. Listen, in most cases, the school will have more teachable time with a young person than the parents will. So you're trying to instill in your kids Christian values. You bring them to church. Uh, You know, you, you, you send them to activities. If the church has them, you send them to camp. You want Christian values at home. You try to teach them Christian values. But they, they go off to school and a bunch of people take, try to take those Christian values away from them and steal the very truths of the word of God away from them, telling them they came from monkeys. Hmm? Telling them the Bible's not true. Telling them you don't have to listen to anybody, you don't have to obey authority, on and on we could go. So everything you're trying to do in a home, they're erasing in the school. Causes confusion in the young people. And so we we need to be careful that we're doing everything we know how to do to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Then there's a third place. Go over to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 6. Look at verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Listen, God understood how dangerous it is for Christians to yoke up with unbelievers. God understood that if we're really going to live a Christian life, like we're supposed to live a Christian life, we are to separate from the ungodly. Now, I said this morning, that doesn't mean we're Amish. You know, the Amish don't want anything to do with the world. That's why they wear those clothes and, you know, they isolate themselves and they intermarry and all that kind of thing. Uh, they, They took separation to an extreme is what they've done. All right? We're not saying that. But we're saying we shouldn't have close ties and yoke ourselves up together with those who are not saved, those who are the ungodly. God expects that of us. We're to be, as I said earlier in in this morning's message, we're to be in the world but not of the world. That's kind of like a bubble, you know. The world's a big bubble, and inside of that bubble of the world, we are a bubble. Now, we got to function inside there But we're never to let that world penetrate our bubble. You understand? So, if we're really going to separate from the world and not yoke up with unbelievers, then we need to to take our kids and teach them separation and that we're not in agreement with a lot of things of this world. Now, I believe in Christian school from kindergarten right up 12th grade. Some people say, well, you know, I want to put them into 8th grade and then I'll send them somewhere else so they get all the good stuff of the public. Yeah, they'll get the good stuff. And some people say, well, I brought my kid up in a Christian school, you know, they're going to graduate. Now they're going off to a secular university. What kind of thinking is that? Christian college. I believe wholeheartedly in it. 
And we need to encourage our kids, hey, go to Christian college. And, and I'm, this is where the position I took with my kids. I said, hey, it's your life, and I can't decide what you're going to do, but here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to one year of Bible college. Amen? See, I, I learned when I went to Bible college, I was like 34 years old, and I watched all these young kids come in. And I saw some of them come in that really didn't know what God wanted of them. But during that first year of Bible college, God spoke to their heart. God showed them what he wanted. And I think it's a good idea for every young person to go at least one year to Bible college. Now, that's, that's my free philosophy. Now, I want to say this. We have a Christian school, not very big. Fact is, we don't want to be big. We didn't start a school to be a big school. And we really need you to pray because we're next year, right now, we have four students. We need 10. I want you to pray with us about it. Will you do that? By the time school starts, we need 10 students. And I believe God can do that. But you say, if you only have a few students, why do you have a school? Because we have parents who are burdened not to have their kids in a public school. And years ago, God burdened my heart, and God showed me clearly that he wanted us to have a Christian school. And so we started one. And he's never given me any indication that it's time to close it. So we just keep going. We've had up years. We've had down years. We've had good enrollment. We've had not so good enrollment. But we're going to stay doing what God told us to do. And, you know, I count it a privilege to have a Christian school. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of extra finance, uh, finances. It's a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of your, your resources of your church. But it's a privilege to me. See, because every one of these kids that comes through our Christian school, every person who's worked with them has had an impact on their life. You volunteers, you say, I just go listen to them read, or, you know, I just get on to them about their grammar. Because they say ain't never had no education, you know, that kind of thing. But listen, they'll never forget you. They will never forget that you came and you listened. You've had an impact in their life. Brother Mike, you've had an impact in their life. Grandma Gilmore's had an impact on their life. She takes the, the break with the younger ones who get a morning break. And she not only takes the break, she feeds them. I told them these kids are never going to want to move on in their grade. Come over here and get breakfast every day. But listen, we've had an impact on their life. We've made a difference for them. Just the fact that you'll come and, and, and work in the school shows that you care about them. And what a privilege that is. I, I, don't, I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't have an impact on people's lives. I thank God for that privilege. Pray for our school. Our school is a school that we started in obedience to God and we keep in obedience to God. It's an opportunity that we want people to have. I wish I could, I could just compel every parent to put your kids in Christian school. Because I, I, know, I know the issues. But I can't. But I can show you what the Bible says. Encourage you warn you and I, we all know this it's getting worse and worse public school is getting worse and worse and it's sad but that's where we are so thank you brother Mike thank you students for being our students being our kids letting us have a part in your life and we look forward to that day when Katie, next year, walk across the platform, get a, hopefully, get a diploma, go on to Christian college, and go on to serve the Lord. And we'll be able to say, hey, I had a little part in that. Hmm? We got Paul down there. He graduates next year? Hopefully. Maybe. <clears throat> But Paul, now he wants to be a preacher. He wants to start a church up here in the Northeast. And 
You know, when we see him do that, we, we can say, hey, we had a part in that. He went through our school. We ministered to him. We put up with him. Amen. But see, that's what it's all about. Not about numbers. Not about getting our name in lights. It's about doing God's work. Here a little, there a little. Doing what God wants us to do. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, volunteers. Thank you, Brother Mike. Thank you again, children. Thank you, church. See, if you didn't support the school, we couldn't have it. What do you mean? Well, we have some people who give every week to the school. The church helps with, with the bills of the school. And the church backs the school. It's a ministry of our church. We had a big argument with the township over that issue. And, and as far as they're concerned, it's not. But as far as we're concerned, it is. This is just like Sunday school, just like, like, like any other part of our church. This is a ministry of our church. So continue to support it. Pray for it. If you can help financially, help out. We can always use the help. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again for our school. Thank you for our young people and the good year they've had. Thank you that they're pressing on. And we do pray for our school that we'll have 10 students for next year. Lord, that's all in your hands. We can't create students. We just trust you. We ask you to bless these young people now. Continue to teach them and help them. Grow them. And Lord, that one day we can see them often serving you. Lord, provide financially for our school. You know that's a burden. And continue to bless our efforts. We pray, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.